Hi, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct consumer marketing world. Welcome to the second event in our summer seminar series, today created by the PDMI's Workshop Council, The Secret Sauce of Customer Lifetime Value. We will welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you're not a PDMI member, but are attending today, we'd love to have you consider joining the association. There's no better way to support the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of this industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any of our team members should you desire more information. One more housekeeping note, the group will be addressing questions from the audience at the end of today's session, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in, and we'll be collecting them, and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. Now, have you found that building trust among uh, customer engagement touch points can be an ongoing marketing challenge? Well, today, we all welcome a group of performance marketing leaders who will share the secret sauce to building customer lifetime value. This conversation will provide new thought ideation on how the total worth of a customer to a brand over the entire period of their relationship is formulated by amortizing your customer's average purchase value, average purchase frequency, and average customer lifetime span and they'll be talking about so much more. Let's meet the group, all of whom represent PDMI member companies. Carrie Chase is Senior Vice President at Modus Direct. Jeff Crane, Jeff Crane is Senior Director of Sales and Marketing at Kingstar Media. David Stellato is Chief Revenue Officer at Global Performance Commerce. And our moderator and PDI, PDMI Workshop Council member, Lori Zeller, is Managing Partner at Thor Associates. Thank you all for joining us. Let's get started, Lori. Take it away. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's a pleasure. I want to thank the panelists. I'm going to give them all just a few minutes to share with you some of the little nuances of made them as brilliant as they are. So David, tell us a little bit about your experiences, your company, and why, uh, as you know, I think you're the most brilliant guy ever. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Dave Stilato, Chief Revenue Officer, Global Performance Commerce. Uh, we are a performance marketing agency focused primarily on digital. Uh, we have our own affiliate network of over 3,000 digital affiliates. We also have our own internal e-tail brands, uh, health and beauty, fitness, wellness, and other categories as well. Uh, and we also specialize in developing software for D2C brands for funnel building, shopping carts, as well as customer service. Fantastic. Jeff, want to give us a little bit about your, uh, your, your thing that makes you move and groove? I'm happy to be the second smartest guy you know, Lori. Uh, I'm Jeff Crane, um, Senior Director of Sales and Marketing here at Kingstar. We're a performance ad agency located in Toronto, Canada. We service the Canadian market. We've been a proud Pete and Mind member for many years now. Uh, we specialize in full service from traditional to offline and to creative, and happy to help anybody that's looking to uh, grow in Canada. Fantastic. And Carrie, I've only recently known, and I love that I know you because your reputation precedes you. So please tell us a little bit about Modus and you and why you're you're excited to be here today. Thank you, Lori. I am excited to be here. Um, Modus Direct is an agency I've worked for for five years, but has been in business for about 15. Um, collectively, we are really, we're performance marketing, but our basis and our love is within the television um, direct response world. Um, we also do things outside of that, and we are really excited about all the um, anticipating all the new things and adventures that CLTV and where television is going to go and be an important part of any company's um, marketing portfolio. So, really excited to be here. Fantastic. So, let's jump into it. it you know, there has to be a secret sauce. I mean, you know, I work with them on the title and that's kind of a funky title, but for all of us at performance marketing and direct response, brand response, we love the term secret sauce. So when we look at customer lifetime value, the first thing I'd like to do, and I'll start with Carrie and then go to Jeff and then David. Uh, Carrie, tell us what is your definition of CLV and what really makes a brand or a client's brand um, differentiate themselves and, and has the consumer lean in? Yeah. So. It's say basically CLV is the measure of total revenue when you take that and then you take out the costs of acquiring them, um, essentially. And then you want to keep that customer as long as possible. And collectively, that is your um, your consumer lifetime value. And this has become we have found 
as I mentioned, our basis is in television. So I've been there since doing things on fax machines and trying to keep people in continuity plans and all of that good stuff. Um, what we, and the challenge that we have is that we find that trying to, in this multi, with digital and multi-touch efforts, it's really difficult to find um, all, or keep up with your clients at, a, at every touch point. So we work a lot of times with, um, with clients in terms of evolving their brand, evolving their offers to make sure that they have as many touch points and as many opportunities so that they can then enhance their customer's lifetime value. You and I had talked offline. Carrie, I want you to tell everybody listening to this webinar because I thought it was a brilliant statement. Tell us about the why. What you brought to my mind, I never like defined it that way, but I think that's part of the secret sauce. I think if you can go after why your customer needs your product or service, pretending you're the brand, you know, it's important. Why did you do why instead of how, what? what yeah. Why? I mean, why, why, why? <laughs> Why the why? Um, why I mean, we're why? solving because I think that that gets to why defines the how. You know, it sets the table, it sets the strategy for all that you really do. Why is the person so? You know, for some of our clients, it is the um, is you know that's the essence of the existential question. So we work with them again, like I said, the, to kind of right. work with understanding what they are doing and then driving that across multiple channels. Um, again, our basis is more on the television, radio, the traditional um, media platforms. And we want to have that client understand why they're doing that because then it helps set the strategy. Right. And Jeff, tell us your definition. And then Jeff, you and I spoke offline. You talked a little bit about what the customer wants and how to overtake what makes the customer lean into their desire to purchase versus just wanting something they feel like they need it. So how, how, yeah. do, they, how do they define CLV up in Canada, Jeff? Yeah, you know, you know we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll do it with the Canadian accent, Lori, but you know, a lot of it's interchangeable with LTV. So I think that's a common term uh, in, the, in the market is that lifetime value, customer lifetime value. And it's really the combination of purchase revenue generated by one consumer from the date of that first purchase. Uh, nowadays, there's some automation that if you're with Shopify, there's apps that are automatically going to calculate it. Old school, traditional ways, if you're doing it through TV and radio, it's going to be um, Excel, manual Excel spreadsheets. And I really do think that for the customer to really get them to come back, we talked about that need, Laurie, and them wanting the product they need in their everyday life. Perhaps it's something that they can't live without. Their friends are always reordering it, so they need to keep up. Uh, so it's really creating that stickiness with the consumer and wanting that product or service time and time again. Excellent. And David, um, being really more of the marketer on the panel, you and I talked a little bit about personalization, the messaging, what draws the consumer to the brand and keeps them loyal. So give us your definition and then wrap it around what, what you've experienced and what you've found to be true as a secret sauce to um, increasing lifetime value and increasing LTV. Sure, I, I mean, you know, again, just as both the other panelists said, is that full of acute value that comes from the customer, not just from that initial sale, but throughout the many touches through history with them and ongoing. Um, I think that the biggest thing, especially when it comes to personalization and us being very focused and heavily on digital, wherever we can personalize our touch points with the email, SMS, other methodologies and remarketing, retargeting in the ads, even on the pages, being able to geo IP locate someone and personalize it to if they're in New Jersey or if they're in somewhere in California, these little things all help with giving that personalized touch and making you more aware of that person and what their needs are. Um, but overall, I think the biggest thing is that being able to convey not just a sales pitch every time you're following up with them, but showing there's other additional content and brand value that's going to have them coming back for more and building out a community with them as well. Agreed and an and excellent explanation. So now I'm going to throw a little uh, wrench into our conversation. We didn't do this in the run through. So I'd like uh, whoever wants to go first is fine. I want, I want you to share with our viewers the contribution to overhead part that always seems to create a wrench for customer lifetime value. It's good to have average order value, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but what we're finding at Thor with our clients is 
they'll look at customer lifetime value in digital. They may look at ROAS and, you know, in traditional carry that they're looking at um, the impressions. They're looking at, you know, they're looking at all of the data that we always look at. But what we're starting to see is that many CEOs, presidents, they're starting to put this line item of contribution to overhead, which takes away from the customer lifetime value because they're decreasing it. They're decreasing, like maybe it's two months, three months that the customer stays on, but the cost of acquisition was X, so Y becomes this. Are you finding any of that? And is there any way to overcome that? Anybody can go and jump in. Yeah, I'll just take a quick stab. I think it is important, Lori, to apply some cost to that repeat purchase. I think we're so used to easily attributing it to the first purchase because we know the amount of media dollars we spend, uh, whatever it costs to create the content, uh, but then you're not really assuming the manpower it took to maybe develop that email drip campaign, the creative to uh, build that, uh, and that kind of talent hour. So some overhead should be applied to those second, third, and final purchases. Uh, it's just really a matter of massaging it so that it makes sense. Carrie, David, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I would say that it's it's actually also interesting media costs, you know, kind of applying that over the course of time. And as a direct response DRTV um, expert, we are always looking for opportunities or that schedule of having things that are that do get a lot of impressions, but also having that level of efficient DRTV media that's going to help. I think with that with that overhead cost and um, allow that lifetime value to shine through. David? Yeah, internally for our internal brands, we actually do attribute the COGS for the, the SaaS platforms as well as the operators and creative um, when we're looking at what they'll call it lifetime profit. Um, but when they're going through and seeing what efforts and what products we're pushing and trying to scale more versus others, because even with our internal database, we have over 10 million customers we've acquired over through the years. There, you know, we have a plethora of different uh, sub products or upsells and different things. And so we just make decisions based on frequency and profitability of which products we're actually gonna be promoting based on that. Interesting. So which leads me to the next question. And again, anyone can jump in first. Talk to me about attribution. And if attribution either uh, supports customer, you know, the customer loyalty, the customer lifetime value, the way we see it as marketers from our point of view, all of us, or or is there different ways to do it? I mean, I'm thinking specifically, you know, in Facebook, we have first click or we have seven day view. You know, there's different things that go on now that weren't going on a long time ago. And I feel that they really have an impact on the customer's connection to the brand. Are you seeing that as well? Or is there... I don't know, I'm like totally, I could be off base. Or if you think there's a different way to discuss attribution, bring that on. Bring it on. Bring it on, my friends. I would say, that, I mean, I'll jump in that, I mean, attribution is is really critical. And that has probably been one of the biggest things that I've seen change. I mean, we used to just have a straight, you know, you call the number on the screen and you would have it. Now it is all over the place. Um, it is a constant challenge as far as being able to do it, not only from, picking out the individual, but across all the different data points. Um, what we have found is that you can't, you don't necessarily get your that immediacy. Um, it has to do with the modeling and it gets better with the modeling. So you have to be a little bit patient, which is very hard to do, but you kind of to, to really okay. see and get the right data. So that's kind of what we were, that's how I we think that's a great point. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think patience has become uh, a necessity, whereas we would always, most of us as marketers, media media marketing, we would we would pivot on a dime. This isn't working. Let me get through it. Uh, yeah. Especially in David, you should probably talk about this uh, in digital. You can't do that at all. You have to let it run. You have to let the algorithms of the platforms get used to what's being presented. It's a whole thing. It, attribution is crazy, and it it could be a whole webinar in itself. Um, our team even is developing digital fingerprint printing technology to cross track users from one of our properties to another one of our properties. But even with the methodologies of us driving uh, sales to our funnel sites, there's always going to be a fall off halo effect of people going to Amazon and buying. And then there's no real perfect way to track that at this point. We, we can make assumptions around what percentage that is because we can see, you know, as our volumes increasing on our paid media to our funnel site and seeing the sales pick up uh, on the same time on Amazon, but it's not a perfect science. 
Yeah, I, I love that. David says it's not perfect at all. And you know, when you look into your Google dashboard or your Facebook dashboard, it's showing the ROAS for one purchase. It's not assuming anything for uh, what that person purchased, you know, six, 12 months down the road. So you gotta do it all manually and uh, in perfect science for sure. How do you, the three of you, can you comment on, 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 we talked a minute ago about how we pivot, how we need patience. What, what new marketing tactics, what new omni-channel um, deliverable, deliverance is, is, is happening in 2023? And what do you predict is going to start happening moving forward? I think we're all begging for a technology that can uh, attribute everything uh, all at once and give a portion of the sale to each of the mediums that actually affected that sale. But unfortunately, we're still in, again, this not perfect uh, world that David alluded to where someone might see the product for the first time on TV, then they're scrolling through Instagram and then they touch engage, read reviews, then they go to Google, a couple of final reviews, and they finally make the purchase on Amazon. Well, Amazon's getting all the uh, credit for it, but really the first touch is TV. So I don't, there's really no perfect answer, unfortunately. If you guys have one, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> no perfect answer. Describe that perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, it's the daily struggle with us uh, as far as that goes. Um, I think that we, we've actually found with some of our clients, and it's kind of interesting, they're going back. It's almost backwards that they we have all this attribution and then they're using customer surveys, uh, um, a couple of them as a kind of a North Star to evaluate because it, it also kind of cuts through because it's how the person really, I think it comes from the customer, which is the whole basis of what the conversation is about is extending that and being that relationship. So how do they see that connection? Um, and so what we have seen on the TV side is um, it's a little counter, counterintuitive to what we normally go after, you know, the best cost per order. But what we see is that if we are doing or investing, like I mentioned before, we have some that are higher impressions. We see an almost an immediate spike in the, um, co the consumer surveys. So that has been a nice, it's nice to have because it's not. It's not down to those fractional little itty bitty beats. It's kind of like, oh, you know, we spent. 10% on TV, but we're seeing 13.5% of the surveys come back and attribute it to television. So they know we're getting it there. David, you want to say anything? You're yeah, good. I think, I think I'm good on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about um, average order value. So average order value, as we all know, really I think it's one of those those metrics that really determine um, when a, a brand is a client or a brand is going to uh, move up or down in terms of how much more they're going to invest into their media plan as it stands and or require a change. So tell me how you believe average order value fits into the model of the secret sauce and or how I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm, hoping somebody's going to say something that's going to say, don't worry about average order value anymore. This is how you have to think about it. So I'll say that one more time. Don't worry about average order value anymore. This is how people need to start thinking. So tell me, David, how do people need to start thinking or, or, or just dispute what I'm saying and saying, where are you, where are you crazy? Well, I think it depends what? on the, the types of product you're selling, right? There and the ticket, right? There, exactly. There's some people who are selling right. higher price items. Um, where really average order value is a big portion of it. Now it's going to make that, that LTV a little bit of a longer drawn out, harder play. So for example, we have a health and fitness brand where we sell lots of gadgets and gizmos like fitness watches and smart scales. And on those, it, we really do focus on getting that initial average order value, but we will re-engage the customers, you know, on the fitness watches, we'll upsell them, cross sell them down the road on additional watch bands or other products that make sense. Now, on the flip side of that, you know, we've partnered on a, a beauty brand where it's the universal vitamin C serum, where there's going to be, you know, a consumption of this product on a monthly basis. And in that case, you know, AOV isn't as important. We want to get as many customers in the door as we can. Um, and there's, there's some tricks you can play. You can get them in on an initial sale and you can even do different bundle packs where they can buy a three month or six month or more supply and then remarket them later on a continuity to help further drive your LTV. Um, and these are things that have been helpful in that regard. I love it. I agree. Jeff, or 
Yeah, I, I like what what David said, and we you know we talked about this uh, in our in our pre meet is that a lot of uh, brands will take a loss on that first sale because like David said, they're going to get into the funnel, and we know we're going to make it up at some point. It's funny, I was driving home from the office yesterday. There's a storage unit said first month free, you know, so they're trying to offer that first. They'll take the loss knowing that that CLV over the course of time will more than make up that free month that they gave it. Yeah, I mean, I think David also touched on an interesting point, which we haven't discussed. And most direct response people have been around the block, like myself and my partner, Fern, Fern Lee's been around for about 35 years. And, and it's brilliant watching the transition in her brain. Uh, I'll just share with you. So, you know, it was there was this really strong push for either subscription based or continuity. Continuity was like, let's just do continuity and let's do nutraceuticals, let's do fitness, let's tie it all together. What's the whole system look like? And that's that we're moving away from that a little bit, but continuity is a huge opportunity for revenue. So how does that fit into customer lifetime value? Because when you drop off your your con you know your subscription, your your continuity. The customer life and value is, goes, as we say in New Jersey, David, it goes to shit. Somebody <laughs> tell somebody, so somebody uh, help me out here. What do you think? Um, I'll, it really is important, and it, it kind of varies from the client to client um, or the brand to brand. If you have the opportunity to do continuity, we've had several that have really looked at that. They kind of saw what Chewy did and really wanted to emulate that across so many of their of their ways. And if you have a broad um, skew, if you have a large number of skews, then I think that that fits into it. We've had clients that have unfortunately suffered for just having you know limited um, supply, which used to be kind of like the you know the snuggie or something, and you just sold a crap ton. That's a Chicago right? that, but and you were fine. So it's really finding that balance and grow it and, and then also instructing with the, with the with the clients so that they are doing the right steps. Um, they are, again, engaging with the customer so that it's not just constant resell or it's con they're being they, they get a bad taste. Of it's knowing the cadence um, and then offering it to them on their terms. And I think that that's really important as well, because that continues to work with the, with the client and building that relationship. And that I think is the key to it. David, Jeff, anything you wanna to add to that? Continuity, no. I mean. I, I think reiterating on the continuity piece, I mean, obviously you need to keep the customer engaged, not just send them a new bottle each month, right? And so with our beauty brand, one of the things that we've done well with is, you know, we'll, we'll do constant email communications and we're not beating them over the head with them, but they'll get regular communications of, you know, maybe the products were featured in the press, maybe there's some new beauty regimens or things they can try. And they've also done a really good job at building out a Facebook community of all the actual customers so they can engage and interact with each other. So there is talk and conversation around the product, keeping it top of mind, but not every touch point being a uh, buy more. Yeah. And David knows better than anyone, but you know, at continuity, it's going to end at some point. Everybody is at some point in the lifetime going to cancel. If you have enough data, you know what the average month or days that someone's going to stay is. So then you can kind of adapt that to your CLV. That will help drive your first touch acquisition costs. And then, like David said, they're always doing things to grow that average cut of the continuity, we'll call it. Yeah, I agree. And David also, um, being somebody that um, knows exactly where I need to go with all this. Thank you, David. So he brought up um, email strips and, and retargeting. So what I'd love to hear from all of the three of you is, um, and we discussed this offline also, the, the, the strength of what email retargeting marketing is to customer lifetime value and what is the secret sauce to developing uh, an effective email campaign that Carrie would support you know, media, Jeff, that may, you know, give you a little bit more of a, a you know, not, not an on the channel, but like, you know, you do digitally, you do, um, David, I'm leaving it up to you to be the marketer here, but, and I know you do more than that, but, you know, give, you know, give, given the, the digital side, and Jeff, I know that's a strong part of your background. So talk, talk to everybody a little bit about email being uh, really the secret sauce and, and 
we discussed before the contribution to overhead. I, I don't find email retargeting very expensive. Do, do, do any of you? I don't find it expensive at all. So it's it's almost like a no-brainer to do it, and then it strengthens the entire campaign success, right or wrong? Carrie? Yes. I mean, as I said, from media side, I don't have a lot of experience on the email. Um, but what I can tell you is that I, uh, my group has been benefit has benefited greatly from email information and data because that helps our CLTV. We can match those that list and then use it to target those people on television. So it works and complements, I think, both sides of it. And that's been really kind of very important for um, our development on the CTV side and the CTV side of things. Jack? Yeah. Well, you know, I think two things. Lori is one, we all know the rising cost of media. Uh, it's a more competitive landscape now. It's tougher uh, than it ever has been to acquire that first customer. We don't even have to go into the cookie-less future and how difficult it is to retarget people. So getting that email is more important than ever and getting them into an ecosystem uh, where they're gonna purchase again from you is so important. And second, I think it really gives an opportunity for personalization. For personalization is a huge trending topic in the marketing world now. And you have the opportunity to tailor your email to that person. You have a lot of information about them. You know their age, you know their gender, uh, a few of other a few other things. So you can really tailor and create different segments within that list and customize that email to those segments. David, you didn't answer yeah. it? I would just reiterate email is is a key component of all of this. Um, it's been a huge thing for all of the efforts with our in-house brands and our third party partners. I would like to add, you know, for a younger demo, not so much an older demo, because they may find it a bit abrasive, SMS and push notifications have also started to kind of creep in there and becoming more socially acceptable, whereas it would be very intrusive uh, traditionally. Um, I've even actually, it was interesting, I had a conversation yesterday after our, our prep with a few folks and there's a couple of brands that are now starting to actually even do and go, I don't want to say old school, but doing direct mail again, taking digital customers and mailing them um, to get additional touch points and outbound customer survey calls and upselling them that way as well. So I thought that was very interesting. It's, um, we've done it through Thor, David. It's, uh, it becomes a home run because actually what, what can happen now is you can capture somebody who's, um, hasn't who has filled hasn't finished filling out form A, so the, the or they may be in the cart they abandon. You grab all of their their data if you can, you know, they've opted in, and then you either deliver them a postcard or you deliver, you know, you go back and do a direct a piece of direct mail, and it's effective. It's very very effective. Um, I I was curious if through all of this. Each of you could discuss the idea of what makes a qualified lead. <laughs> Tough one, Lori. I think it's Ooh. different. Brand, yeah. You know, uh, okay. depends, like different services. We, we have uh, clients that are working in the insurance category. Uh, and for them to qualify somebody, they need much more than just an email or a phone number. They actually need to know, you know, stuff like their address, their family, their income, uh, et cetera, if they're smokers or not. So I think. A qualified lead is different to every individual uh, and really it's up to the brand to decide uh, what it is for them. That is that word, what is a qualified lead has been the bane of my existence for um, <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> we also do a lot of um, Medicare Advantage um, business and every client has a different definition. Sometimes the definitions change midstream in the middle of the campaign. So um, we have been as Basic as timing, you know, a call that lasts a minute can, has got to be, you know, they've expressed some interest. But it really, I think what's important and maybe what would be interesting for the, the is, is kind of having a definition to what Jeff says. It, it may be different for everybody and it's fine, but it is landing on a definition and kind of sticking with that and not having it evolve so that then we have that foundation that we can then build off of and enhance. And maybe it does change eventually, but you need to kind of test against it and it it, does, it cannot bounce around. I mean, I think that so that to me is the biggest thing because, yes, what they, what is a lead is kind of like it's <laughs> arch experience. Yeah, I would I would echo what Carrie said. Yeah, go ahead, David. 
Yeah. No, I would say I, this is one of those times where I'm very grateful that I focus primarily on e-commerce. So a sale is either a sale or not a sale. So it's they've either paid or they're not. And that's the definition for the, the acquisition. But for the campaigns where we do work on on a lead gen basis, it is very specific to every single campaign, how it's defined. But it is 100 percent paramount that both the advertiser and the marketer are on the same page of what the actual definition is and that there's test leads, examples, examples. Everybody knows exactly what is what. So, pixels are firing right. on the right yeah. page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they if they do fire, if they're not messed up, and and it's also, I mean, I think Carrie, you know that we do FORS and Medicare Advantage as well. I think Jeff does some insurance stuff. The the also it has to do with compliance and CMS, like with, with Medicare Advantage. Like what what is you know what is allowed in in the TV's creative or what is allowed on the on the postcard being sent and what disclaimers do you have to use? I've I've found for me personally when I've received marketing materials, sometimes those disclaimers discourage me from purchase. You know, I'm like, well, I'm not really sure. Like why do they have to tell me all these things? Now I'm not really so keen on this. So in your experience, the three of you, have you found that customer lifetime value and loyalty to a brand, what draws, you know, what bakes that that warmth and keeps it you know ter terrifically cozy any any anything you want to add in that respect um, i mean i'll jump it the i think that well, kind of the way you were saying as far as disclaimers it kind of made me think about um the way that we do tv spots in a way that um and, and I don't think I don't know if this answers. I don't think it answers the question 100. But, but having an actual, we find that having testimonials, real people, as opposed to actors, when you do that and they're kind of portray, an actor portrayal, um, that can be a little bit of a problem. So we love to have real people. I don't have as many because TV, when you have a list of of a ton of different disclaimers, or you have a list on pharmaceuticals where it's worse than what you're trying to solve for. I definitely think that it erodes that initial relationship, which I think collectively we've all discussed is having a good engagement with your clients, building it over time with trust, um, knowing a right cadence to do email marketing, to offer them new products. Those all go into that mix, that secret sauce. So I think being honest and truthful right out of the gate is a critical first step. So I couldn't agree more with Carrie. I think like trust and honesty, especially in this day and age, people are very sensitive now. Uh, and, you know, you have to really show that trust. You show that you care about them uh, and that the brand is actually thinking about them. So definitely echo Carrie's statement. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it all comes down to communication, quality, service. I mean, people want high quality products. They want to hear from you and they want to be engaged when you're engaging them. Um, or when they're inbound engaging, they want to be answered properly and promptly. Authentically, I agree. And the one thing that I think takes away from that, I'm wondering if you agree with me, the three of you, when we offer rewards or discounts or, you know, a BOGO offer, like sometimes we'll do something to to grab, I think you said it earlier, Jeff, that the, the customer purchasing power in the beginning, knowing that there might be uh, a recoup towards the end. I'm finding that those offers now are becoming a little bit more difficult. Are you agreeing or disagreeing? Yeah, I, I think people are, are kind of, they know the gimmicks now, Lori. Uh, everybody's seen all the BOGOs, the just $1 now, $1 a day, and then they look at their credit card three months later, and it's $30 a month or $30 a day. So people are getting a little bit uh, smarter now, but David knows and you know anybody that does mass offers has tested each of those offers and I'm sure they measure the lifetime value or customer life value of each of those first time acquisition sales that they tried uh, and perhaps you know the continuity is is shorter when it is that kind of freemium BOGO versus just hey this is what the cost of the product is and this is what it's going to be next month. The other thing I have to add, I think that clients our clients have gotten a little bit stingier in terms of giving away the store right out the bat so that we have a lot of times where it's an offer that is consistent and it doesn't really evolve very much. Um, you know, it might be 10 percent, 15 percent, but it doesn't, you know, they'll do and they'll hold back. It's not every holiday that you start when you have something that's a deep discount. You kind of wait for really big premier moments. 
David? It's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I mean, even just thinking of some things like, you know, I do a lot of products around the house and I go to Home Depot probably more than I go to the grocery store, but the way they've changed their rewards programs over the years and their discounts, it's, you know, you get uh, 10% off every once in a while, but now that the font's special and it says, oh, you need to spend 300 bucks to get this. And it's like, but now I think it's doing the reverse. I'm less likely to go there. Um, and the same thing I see with my wife or my mother with their, their Kohl's coupons. If they don't get a 30 out of the gate, they're not running out the door. But when they do, they, they'll still go. So I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting one. I, I think to, to your point, you know, Lowe's has this 5%, you can become a contractor. So I'm certainly not a contractor. I like to do projects. So I will always shop at Lowe's first because across the board, no matter what I purchase, I get 5%. When I'm at Home Depot, I have to pick and choose what I'm what I'm purchasing and why I'm purchasing. So, so that matters a lot. I think the, the, there's a big thing there. I think that also that um, when it comes to the customer lifetime, like so, so that speaks volumes. You know, am I a, a Lowe's customer or am I a, a Home Depot? I don't know. I think I'm a Lowe's because I, I purchase what I want I, at the price I want, and I continue to go back, and it makes it easy. The other thing that's starting to happen, I see, and I'm wondering if you're agreeing, is that customer service is starting to falter. I think post-COVID, a lot of employee uh, issues sprung up. A lot of people realize they don't need to have a whole customer service department. I feel like this is going to be the bane of, of America's existence. I think we're going to, that whole thing going to the wayside is going to really affect how brands are um grow and how royalty remains a part of it. You want to have a, anyone have a quick thought about that before we jump into some of the questions from the audience? Uh, well, customer service, one thing I think is very interesting, especially with digital. Um, that being said, I agree with you. I think there's been this, you know, post COVID, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, not a short temper, but a, a lot, a, not as much sincerity or patience as there traditionally has been. Um, and that being said, though, I mean, artificial intelligence, chat GBT, all these other things are now coming to play to digital where uh, a bot can help service you quick and fast and easy and get your refund or your return done. And I think there may be a swing where people are maybe even prefer just doing it that way. It's, uh, you know, even going back to the old adage of going to the bank where you're going to a teller to do your business or just go straight to the ATM. You know, you have a subset of people who prefer a human being and then others who don't want to have to deal with anybody. I just want to get the business done and walk out. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that progresses and shifts because there, there's always going to be people who want to talk to someone and have a genuine, authentic conversation. And I really think it's going to vary depending yeah. on the type of purchase and brand. Yeah, I echo David's statements. I think you got to think too about the younger generation. Uh, I'm not going to age anybody here, but there's a time where we didn't have cell phones and we're now dealing with a, a generation who's becoming into the buying power where they've only ever grown up digitally. and They don't want to speak to anybody on the phone. They're not as concerned about that tailored customer service. And like David said, they'd love to go on a chatbot, get everything figured out, not have to speak to everybody and, and get what they want. Yep, I agree completely. It's It's kind of that, tipping point between, I feel like everybody can almost have their own dashboard for whatever account you, know, you go to your account, but then there are those moments that you, when you have an issue that cannot be satisfied by all of that, then you immediately, you kind of go to the bot, you try to answer, <laughs> you put in something that you know the bot's not gonna be able to answer, that will then strike it, like the new version to what Jeff said is just hitting zero right away instead of going through the whole tree um, <laughs> to talk to a person, I knew. So, um, I think there will always be a need. Um, I'm kind of there's a mattress brand here in Chicago that has absolutely no no employees. It's just you go up to a screen and you know. And I was I was really I thought like this is very interesting because I think it's going to be appealing to some and then other people. It's like I don't want a salesperson you know on top of me like a used car person, but I wouldn't mind somebody to kind of talk and answer questions as opposed so. I think we're at a really interesting moment as far as that whole, I think it's a great comment, Laurie, just because I think it is changing and I think it's generational by and large. I agree. So that's the questions we've had, Tom. I know that you're still with us and um, I would love for you to ask a question that would get these three to speak a little bit against each other because they're all so smart. They're all, they're rifting off of each other's brilliance, and I'd like to see a little bit of disruption here. So, Tom here, do you have any questions from the audience for us? 
Carrie, David, why do you hate Canada? <laughs> <laughs> well, about three weeks ago, there was an orange fog outside my window and it smelled like a campfire. No, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, got, we do have some good questions here, um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll run through them. <clears throat> uh, first one that came through, are you still running into clients who are giving short shrift or perhaps not even thinking about uh, lifetime value? And if so, what do you tell them? That they better get used to a lower MER or a ROAS, uh, and kind of a, the back in the day, like Lori said, that one purchase, they're used to the phone in MERs of three plus, and you can get those all day. It's very difficult now to maintain that just off one sale. So as long as they have a brand that can sustain that and a cost of goods that's uh, able to hit that margin, then all the power to them. Yes, all the time, uh, especially people in new startup modes. Um, you know, we, we try to educate them again, us being in a unique position of being a media partner and also being an e-tailer brand. We, we, we tell them learns the lessons we learned through the years, you know, you know, not what money we were leaving on the table by not doing email and by not doing SMS, by not being on Amazon in addition to our DTC sites. So it's really important for people to be doing this. And it's, I don't want to say low hanging fruit because there is effort, but it's definitely much easier than trying to acquire a new customer. Yeah. Sorry, Lori. No, no, <laughs> no <laughs> 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 We're gonna get another question. <laughs> so, no, I agree, and um, it's 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 one of those things. The only thing that is a little bit is what I had mentioned earlier is that we are finding some success in things that are necessarily being as efficient, but are helping expand some of the um, clients that are in a growth or scale mode. And but we're always on the same page, so we're not really fighting with them or ha having to educate. It's more of a collective understanding. Um, of them media strategy. Great. Great. Um, next one, uh, and kind of touches back, uh, I think, a little bit where you were at there, Dave, in the, in the question, the previous question. Uh, someone wants to know, what's the tipping point of success where a brand or marketer should start considering lifetime value as important or more important than creating initial sales? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I think it should be part of the, I mean, I think that you should be planning toward it. So it should be something that will evolve right off the bat. You should have at least an idea of where you want to get to. Um, maybe different, but I think as far as, I would love that. I don't know if every client is, <laughs> is there, but it should be part of the, initial conversations um, as you talk about where you see each, each other in six months and then a year and how that will evolve. Yeah, I think just to that point that Carrie said, I mean, if you're as a brand not considering uh, CLV or LTV, I can promise you that your competitor is. Uh, so for you to stay competitive in the marketplace, it has to be something that's that's part of the process. Yeah, I, I would say even you know thinking about it when we're building out a new campaign for new product line, I mean it's even us just emphasizing the importance of clients having not just being a one product brand, right? Having multiple things where they can upsell, cross sell, and having that rudimentary foundation, even starting with the abandoned cart emails and doing some upsell, cross sell promotional emails. So I think starting on day one in some level is important. Um, you're just it's not going to become your core focus or a huge piece until obviously you're building that user base. That's great. Um, uh, this one came in during the continuity discussion, um, and I, I'll, I'll editorialize a little bit because I can recall back in the day, Guthy Rinker uh, on our stage back at uh, Response when we were doing those events said that um, with Proactive Solution, they didn't hit break even until month four, but their average customer lasted 13 months. So set that as a standard um and obviously times have changed but how far short of the break-even point can an initial price be when launching a continuity program and how can a brand start afford to start a lower entry price point and ensure success or at least eventual break-even I think to to have a brand that's starting continuity for the very first time to try to predict 
uh, when they're going to have a break even point is almost impossible. I think there's going to be a big test and learn uh, and probably just, you know, try to modest and plan out and strategize, understand the budget that you have to risk uh, to figure out what that break even point is before you start scaling the media dollars uh, to a point of no return. Yeah. I think the cross per order has to be established in the beginning and, and then work and then you need to work backwards because yeah, yeah. unless you establish that KPI or a similar one, you're, you're never going to get there. And, and as time goes on, and even with subscription or continuity, as you're, as you're looking at your metrics and scrubbing through what's really clean and what's not, you, the only thing that I think you can really argue against is, well, I, I'm below the, K, you know, the CPO, so what, what, what can I say? You know, you're not going to say it like that's your client, but you know, we're, we're, we're meeting our rows. We got, we got this. It's, you know, it, it, it fluctuates. You, you, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and, and Tom, I'll let you go back to questions in a minute, because I, I think it's important that everybody comments on this. I find it crazy when influencers have one price that they get to offer to the public, and your website has a different, and then there's a television commercial carry that like doesn't have the, the, the offer. And, and, am I nuts to find I, it, it's the bay? It, it drives me crazy because I feel like, you know, people will they'll go online, they'll research. Amazon will charge this. The television commercial is charging that. There's a so help help me help help me help me calm down, everybody. Give me give me your insights. We used to actually Lowe's used to be a client for a different agency I worked with, and we would have a different price. That it, it was a very was a delicate moment between making sure that the price on television was not um, lower than what it was at the store or they would get a big problem with that. So we augmented it by, and this is a very DRTV, um, is adding like a, a, a carrying case or something that you couldn't get that was it was the product, but it was a little bit different. I'm also responsible for now, that's what I call music, which was, very much in that regard that we were selling a product for, you know, $24 that you could go down to Target to get for 12 when people still bought CDs, but we threw in a beach ball or something like that that equated the cost. So <laughs> it's a little bit different from the influencer world, but as far as like kind of changing it up in a mild way is, is about the only way that we, I've been in my experience was combating those different prices and what people have to kind of go through to jump through those hoops. Yeah, I would agree. We would do alternatives to the offer, um, slightly change the, the package so it's a different type of bundle. Or I've even seen it where some partners have launched the similar product under two different brands. So they'll have a, a brand for television for retail yeah. and then one for digital. Yeah. Great, great, great. Um, last one uh, from this end. And this came up during the qualified leads conversation that someone's prompted, I think, thinking, certain industries are offering more qualified leads just based on their nature. Are there certain industries or sectors where it's easier to measure lifetime value than others? And if so, what are they? Yeah, I think like David said in the beginning, the ones that where you get the purchase right away, uh, you know that order value and you know it's gonna be maybe one or two purchases, easiest to measure. The more complicated ones are when the continuity can be three months, 12 months, 21 months, really difficult to predict. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, because I've worked with both, like the insurance is really difficult um, to maintain and it's way out of the, you know, from the media and marketing side of whether or not people are going to stay with that particular plan. So that tends to be really difficult to evaluate versus, you know, kind of a consumer product good where you have a good sense of what that customer journey is. Um, so I think that that's something where you have much more predictive um, planning that you can employ. Yeah. All right. All no right. I'm going to rejoin you guys. Uh, thank you to all, all of you. Lori, thanks for pulling the group together. David, Carrie, Jeff, amazing uh, insights as amazing. always from you guys. We appreciate you guys taking the time out as uh, members to join this conversation and, and for all of your, your efforts to support the PDMI. 
Um, also, thanks to the PDMI Workshop Council for the ideas here. Um, if you're a PDMI member and would like to get involved, you can reach out to me and directly share your interest in this council or any of the others today. Your next opportunity to attend a PDMI event live online is our next edition of Take 20, our bi-monthly webinar series created by the Brand Response Council. Next Wednesday, July 26th at 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, performance marketing experts will delve into the use of data spines and data graphs. To register for the webinar, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. Also, online registration is now open for PDMI West, October 11, 9th through 11th in San Diego. With 10 planned educational sessions, four special networking events, and even more planned, PDMI West promises to be a performance marketers and must attend event of the fall. Badge holders also get first opportunity to book their hotel rooms in our discounted blocks at the event's uh, new host hotel, uh, the luxurious Intercontinental San Diego. Visit the pdmi.com slash pdmi-west for more information and to grab your badge today. Thank you again to our group here today. Thanks to all you attending. Be well. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.